Hi, I'm Tomasz Pajdla, and I will present today our work on camera pole computation with our is to my previous student, Cienek Albo, Zlana and our colleagues, Victor Larson and Akihiro Sugimoto. So let me first talk about what is the rolling shutter. So on the left panel, we see a global shutter camera moving from left to right. So we see that images become somewhat blurry when moving, but straight lines remain straight, even when we move the image, right? On the other hand, on the right hand side, in the right panel, we see a camera with a rolling shutter doing the same motion like the camera on the left. Here, we may notice that images are considerably sharper, but the straight lines become curvy when moving the camera from left to right. Why is this happening? So this is happening because the rolling shutter camera scan images line by line and also expose images line by line and then send them on a serial line. So first, it is the this line which is scanned, exposed and sent, and then the next line and so on and so on. This means that when we move the camera during the image capture, like for instance, on this right panel, we see a camera translating, actually someone was riding a train, going on train and taking pictures by moving fast. We see that perpendicular and vertical objects become, become slanted. This is because the top part of, of, the, of the pole has been taken from a different viewpoint than the bottom part of the pole. So rolling shutter has good and the good things are that it allows to do higher frame rate. It allows to better control exposure time, make it longer, shorter. And it's uh, more unified and cheaper and easier to manufacture than global shutter cameras. On the other hand, it brings problematic issues. And first of all, it brings the problem of image distortions, which are caused by moving the camera while taking the images. And this, if, so if the camera stands still, nothing is, nothing is happening. So the, the rolling shutter per camera then becomes undistinguishable from a global shutter camera. But when it moves, then every line or column, depending on the technology, may be taken at a different viewpoint. And therefore the projection, the final projection is not a perspective projection anymore, but becomes a non-perspective complicated projection. So we can see this in extreme situations when like imaging a propeller or when going on very fast train or when rotating the camera, which actually creates a large uh, velocities on the edges of the image. And other issues are coming from uh, changing the illumination. These flashes, when the flashes are not, when the flash is not uh, performed exactly in the so-called flash window. That means a piece of um, or a time interval in which all rows are exposed. Then we may see some parts of images being uh, illuminated with the flash and other parts without the flash. And when seeing uh, fast motions, we may see very strange effects. For instance, like this string oscillation. Now, rolling shutter actually is almost everywhere these days. So all cellular phones, uh, web cameras, smart cameras, and even professional DSLR cameras actually have rolling shutters. Of course, there is still some fraction of global shutter cameras, but this, is, this, this fraction is very small. Now, the timing of rolling of the exposures may vary greatly depending on, on, on the, depending on the camera itself, on the producer, but also depending on, on the lighting, light conditions, illumination conditions at uh, the time of image acquisition. And in particular in this case, what can we do and what can't we do is to use a rolling shutter camera with a rolling shutter attached, of course, during force 3D reconstruction. So here we have a kind of a standard 3D reconstruction pipeline which targets feature detection 
in image point matching, relative post computation, absolute post computation, triangulation, a finely bundle adjustment, maybe then later post processing, like putting uh, triangulated surfaces on top of 3D, of 3D points which are reconstructed. Uh, the first two boxes in this pipeline are not really uh, affected by a rolling shutter much because the rolling shutter effects are uh, are global effects, are geometrically effects, and in, unless we are in really extreme cases, these rolling shutter effects are, are not, I would say, uh, negligible if you look at small neighborhoods of every image point. However, other, other parts of the pipeline, which include geometric computations and which need modeling of, of camera projection and which rely currently on perspective uh, camera models, they are, of course, greatly uh, influence. And if rolling shutter is ignored in case there is a strong rolling shutter effect, or even I would say a non-negligible rolling shutter effect, then either these parts like absolute relative pose fail completely or the results are uh, degraded. So for instance, here we see a 3D reconstruction, which it was obtained from using global shutter camera. And we see that camera trajectory as it goes along uh, along a building, we see the reconstructive building, we see the great, we see the ground plane, and all the angles are reasonably correct. Uh, lines, vertical lines seem to be vertical and so on. If you do the same thing with a rolling shutter camera, that means an iPhone 4, for instance, or iPhone or whatever other other uh, server phone, we see that the result, there is a result, there are some points, 3D points, but of course, the geometry is distorted, camera trajectory is very different, and also the, the quality and the number of reconstructed features uh, is often smaller. So um, this pipeline has lots of, uh, has many places where we can somehow, um, uh, where we need to uh, change uh, standard processing in order to cope with rolling shutter. In this talk, I will concentrate on one element of the pipeline, which is absolute post computation. It's a camera absolute post computation. And this part, we were studying this, we studied this part for some time, and there is a list of related work, which is uh, our previous related work, and I will basically pick up some elements of, from, from, this, uh, from this sequence of works. So let me first say what is absolute camera pose with rolling shutter. So the normal camera absolute pose can be illustrated on this figure. So we have three points in the we have a three structure, which is known. We know the coordinates of these points in some coordinate system in the world. And then we have an image of those points and we perform matching between these points in space and these points in the images. So, Assuming, for instance, the 3D points have attached descriptors which are previously extracted from images and doing the 3D reconstruction, we can then do this 3D, 2D image matching and find the pose of the camera which sees those points. And the classical problem which has to be solved in order to do this for perspective images is so-called P3P problem or three point problem, which basically needs to identify correspondences between three points in images and three points in 3D. And from those three, uh, three features, from these correspondences, we can formulate a system of algebraic equations, which is relatively simple, which can be solved. And by solving that, we will obtain a rotation and camera pose with respect to the scene uh, coordinate system. And this has been, this is work which started, let's say, in last, in half of 19th century. And then since then, there was a lot, there was a many, many uh, following works, various improvements, different formulations. Simply, this is what, this is a very basic block of every 3D reconstruction uh, pipeline. Now, when we move to rolling shutter, and this is what we study here. The situation is somewhat similar, but more complicated. 
And the complication comes from the fact that we have a more complicated model of the projection, which I will explain later. And we have to take some model of the projection because if we don't have any model, then of course everything becomes very complicated. So as you will see later, under certain reasonable assumptions and reasonable modeling, we can uh, generalize this three point problem to a general problem of finding pose of a rolling shutter camera, but that pose must be generalized as well because actually the camera is moving during the, the, the image acquisition. And so we will generalize that pose. Nevertheless, we can say that some kind of a pose of the camera now as a function of time or as a function of, a, of which row is being taken in the image is, uh, is the result of the computation. And under assumptions, we will move to six correspondences instead of three correspondences. So the problem is more difficult and will basically double the number of measurements which are needed. Still, six image correspondences as a re image, image 2D, 3D correspondences are actually reasonable for practical. absolutely relative pose, they are usually somehow embedded in a robust estimation element, in a robust estimation uh, component of the pipeline, which actually uses it in a way that it generates, in, in order to recover actually matching, right? In order to find image matching, we, we try to recover which, correspond, which points are really corresponding points. And the paradigm is like, like the following generating random tuples of 2D to 3D matches, then computing these uh, poses of the camera from the small number, minimal number of measurements, which allow us to find, fix the camera pose up to a finite number of results. So we need to have a, a maximum finite number of results for one fixed correspondence tuple. And then we uh, verify how many other measurements support this uh, computed pose and optimize and choose the pose which has the largest support. And of course, this is repeated again and again in a ransack kind of a, a ransack kind of a manner. Uh, we can generate all n choose three or n choose six uh, um, trials, or we can we can choose some random subset depending on our our uh, time and computational budget. And this thing calls, of course, for repeating the, the computation of R and C, that means solving for Amera absolute pose uh, many times in a row. So we have to be fast. Now, of course, why we have to be fast, depends how fast we have to be, depends how many samples we need to do in this process. So this is a table which shows uh, in a simplified way, assuming some very simplified model of errors, it, it shows how, what is the dependency of the, of the number of samples, these are the elements in the table, which I have to take in order to have a 95% probability that I will draw at least one uh, gross error-free sample, right? So our model is like this. We assume that some of the points or some of the matches are correct and some fraction of matches is incorrect. So the incorrect fraction of matches is in this first row. So for example, is a 15% of our data, our matches are assumed to be incorrect. The 70% are assumed to be incorrect. Now, another dimension of this table is how large is my minimal sample how many points i have to draw so for three points i have to have three which is not actually listed in this table but for 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 let's say other problems if i have seven then i have a row which shows what is the seven so for instance if i have a 50 percent uh error-free or 50% corrupted data. And if I'm drawing seven samples, I will end up with drawing 382 samples in order to have a chance of 95% probability, 0.95 probability, that at least one of those 3A2 samples will be error-free, will be correct. And assuming that I draw a correct sample, I get my correct model, which should be supported by many other, other points, and I, I win, basically. I find, the, I find the correct thing. So 
Of course, if I am drawing this, this number of samples uh, and if I am computing this either in, uh, in real time, then I am talking about uh, running everything in a sub millisecond time. Uh, sub millisecond in sub millisecond time, of course, even shorter because there's lots of other work to do. So V is important to be fast. So we try to develop models which are fast. Of course, the question is how to be fast and how to do fast solving of our problems. So to be fast, we have to use kind of specialized techniques which will have to make generic data. We don't discuss special cases because discussing special cases costs lots of time and special cases appear very infrequently. So the most of the time actually one wastes effort when discussing very special cases. And then of course we use very strict, optimized hard code and try to make things efficient. Um, this is related to the way how we solve these equations. Uh, and this basically shows the fact that uh, in general, these equations have some coefficients, some input data, and the input data come into the game in a way that uh, the special cases form sort of negligible, negligible set. Like in this, we could see there's a kind of parameter space. This is a generic point, a random point for a point with a random data generated, or these data which are not random, but which have random noise added to them. And here uh, around that, all these white points are actually also generic. There's only some kind of a red uh, area, red, red curves in this particular case, which are curves of special cases when generic algorithms fail. Of course, these, we, have, we know that these cases are rare and therefore we rely on the fact that just generic case. Now, in the in the solving and generating these solvers for, for minimal problems for our post computation, we usually work in two phases. First, like an offline phase, which may be, may be slow, in which case we some fabricate an example of a system. They actually analyze there with some algebraic tools, uh, usually general computation algebraic tools, which reveals structure of the problem and allow us to build certain technique uh, for generic case of the problem. And in particular, what we need to arrive at at some point in our, in our solving is an eigenvalue problem, which we, which we have to set up in some, uh, some specified way. And this is allowed exactly by using generic computation methods. These things be slow, these are done only once. And then um, later, in that online phase, they can be implemented efficiently you, in floating points, can be optimized and so on. So for instance, in this case, uh, we, can, we can automatize to some level this technique uh, some time ago. And since then uh, there were some improvements. Uh, we generated some kind of a technology, which is a MATLAB based uh, generator of these minimal solvers. That means which follow the previous, previous uh, procedure. So they have inside technique where we can enter cert in certain way symbolically, what is the description of the problem? What are the parameters? What are unknowns? We put input equations. Then this is processed. Uh, that generic case is constructed and uh, the the formulas, I would say, which, which lead to an eigenvalue problem are generated. And these formulas basically take original kind of coefficients of the, of the original problem. That means parameters, for instance, coordinates of image correspondences and construct elements of the matrix from which we calculate eigenvalues and eigenvalues are then solutions to the problem. So the first work was coming from ECC 2008. There was a considerable improvement. Then later, like ECC 2000 work, there was an additional improvement a uh, year after. And there are some minor improvements since then. There is still ongoing work in this, in this uh, area. Now, strategy for fast solving uh, gets to the online phase. In online phase, we must be fast. But actually we can be fast because we just only calculate that matrix using the formulas which are generated. And then we numerically solve for eigenvalues or eigenvectors. 
or we can somehow turn the problem to univariate polynomial and use a real root bracketing. That's another option. Now, how we, how we, so we use this technology in order to generate um, solvers in order to compute absolute poles for rolling shutter cameras, right? So let me now explain how we uh, model our rolling shutter cameras and how we pose our problem and what are basically how we get from from geometry of the problem and from data measurements how we get um, to equations which we will then solve using the technology which i described before so okay so first thing we have a standard calibrated perspective projection this is this is this equation right so we have a we have a, a point in space capital x sub i which we which we transform into the coordinate system of the camera so by the rotation matrix r center of the projection c by that we get a vector which is the vector pointing from the from the image towards the capital x point and of course this this vector is up to some scale and now when the camera is undergoing motion during image capture right then at every time of capture at now assuming, for instance, that we capture row by row. So at every time of capture, so every time of a row capture, we have a different pose. So our R and C now becomes functions of time, but time is actually proportional to, to the row coordinate. So now this equation becomes more complex, right? Because we have now this R as an unknown, as a, something which we, which we don't know, actually, the time or the, the position we have on the right on the left hand side. So it becomes more complicated. Now, um, and of course this R, which, be, which was single element before, now becomes a continuum of different rotations and see continuum of different poses as we, as we move the camera in space during image capture. So these are new things. Actually, if you look at it, what happens, consider also, we could see something like, like this picture, right? So as the camera moves, let's say down from this, then every row generates a plane of rays into space, which are the, where the camera was at the time of the capture of that row. Of course, this is simplified model already because each row, each row is not captured at instant time. It's been exposed for some period of time. So if we actually move even during this, this uh, exposition, but if exposition is too low, long, usually we see very blurry images. So unless we, unless we, so this limits in some sense, the use of a rolling shutter uh, altogether and also creates the situation when, the, when these effects of rolling shutter, this modeling the rolling shutter with, with a the single time per row becomes a reasonably, uh, reasonably accurate model. But of course, everything is a model and there are cases when this model is not accurate. Okay, so now the point is how to model these, uh, these R and C, how to model them, because they are in fact the whole continuum of rotations and, and, and positions. And so we can, um, or it's very hard to model all the positions as a continuous path. So, we adopt certain models, certain model of, of what happens during the motion capture. So again, we have this uh, projection and the question is now how to choose a description of R and C as a function of a row in the image. So it's reasonable to say that we have a some pose R naught and C blue C at the beginning of motion capture, right? Then the, then the first row, for instance, is, kept, is taken or the, or the middle row is taken. We can, we can uh, note, we can write down, remember the position of the camera at that point in time. And then the rest uh, during the, the motion will be now expressed in, in a relative kind of uh, relative uh, quantities which are related really to the, to the original pose of the camera. And in fact, this is what we need to now model. So one of the reasonable assumptions, which makes things much simpler, is to assume that we have some kind of a physically uh, reasonable situation when our object is moving with a constant speed. 
So having a constant speed along uh, in the translation component is, is uh, very standard and seems to be a reasonable, uh, reasonable assumption for many, many cases. This rotation is the same thing. We can assume that we have some kind of a constant velocity or constant motion. But of course, the question is constant in what? That very much depends on the parameterization of rotation and we can take various different parameterizations. So many different things appear in, in, the, in the literature and there are many different ways how to parameterize, but at the end, everything is a variation of an idea that I am rotating with a constant angular speed around a single axis of rotation. So these are just, these are basically the, the models which we are, which we'll be working now with. So the full projection model is modeled now like that. And there is one more thing to, to work, to, to go one step further, which we, which we had taken at some point in time in order to arrive to a reasonably solvable model. We, we decided to do certain simplifications and the certain simplifications is to replace in general rotation matrix, which has a very nonlinear constraints of this inverse Rm times Rm should be identity, which is a nonlinear uh, second order uh, polynomial constraints, there are six constraints on elements of Rm. So these are complicated models. So we wanted to win and which bring actually complexity into solving. So we are, it's very hard to, to do solving. We will show actually a solution to this as well, but uh, if, but of course, solving harder system takes more time. So if one can afford to do double something which we call double linearization, which means which one can, if this R naught is, is, I would say known in such a way that this Rm is small, then this Rm can be approximated by, by linearization. So in that case, we can, uh, we can do this uh, and also R0 can be also approximated in by linearization if not R0 is small or if it is known, because if it is known more roughly, then we can transform everything in space such that actually even R0 will be small. So now we have a situation where the motion uh, during, the, the, um, during the capture will be modeled by linearization, which is here. And the motion at the beginning will be modeled by linearization. So why do we do it? We do it because we now have here the single single linear for formula. This W in in brackets, this X represents an anti-symmetric matrix. W is a vector. It's a vector of, of translation of uh, rotation axis. The the size of W, the norm of W, somehow represents the speed of rotation. So the larger the W is, the faster the speed. And the same is for V, right? So this, this represents basically those linearized rotations. And W, V, and T, and C are now unknowns. They are free, and they basically, uh, they basically will be estimated. You may notice that these R coordinates now appear on both sides of these equations and we will be solving this, this, this thing. So known are capital X and R, C and R and C. Unknowns are all the, all basically uh, W, V, C, and T. And lambdas, of course, lambdas. Now, this R0, R0, no, small r, r0, actually represents the, the row at which we consider uh, a capital R node. So it can be first row in the image, but it can be, of course, also a middle row, which, which often is a better way of, of modeling that because we then somehow approximate, uh, approximate uh, because it's a linear approximation, linearization of true motion. So, so it's good to choose the, the right point of approximation, which, which often is as a best point is the middle of the interval we want to approximate. Now, the, how do we do this? Uh, how we construct a solver like for this uh, for this for this special model? Uh, actually, we take six 3D, 2D correspondences and write six times these equations, right? So from one to six, we have a six times this equation. These are vectorial equations. Each of the vectorial equations is actually three equations inside because the vector is three components. So we have 18 equations in total. 
and our unknowns are our lambdas, w's, d's, c's, and t's. So we have the right number of equations, the right number of unknowns, and the next step will be to somehow get rid of the, the unknowns we are not really that much interested in, because the most of all we are interested in w, v, c, and t, but, and, or potentially maybe only v and c and t, that depends, or only v and c, but we are certainly not that much interested in, in lambdas. So we first start eliminating lambdas, and that can be done by standard tricks. So we take uh, kind of an anti-symmetric matrix, which we mul and multiply the previous, previous equations by that matrix. That matrix contains actually the vector of, of uh, image measurements, and that matrix removes the, the components with lambdas. And on the right-hand side, we, we get equations like that, where this S matrix multiplies the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, it kills everything which is lambdas. So this, this way, we, we, we remove uh, our, our um, unknowns. We remove six unknowns. But we also remove in a way six equations because this matrix has rank two and therefore for before we had three equations per, per one vectorial equation but now we have actually only two independent out of those three. Now these equations uh, are actually 12 as I said we lost six out of uh, out of 18 so we have 12 linearly independent equations which can be written in a matrix form. So we can put down on the right hand side, we can put uh, unknowns like uh, C's, T's, actually W's, and also products of those, those elements. And the uh, end matrix we put the coefficients which multiply these monomials of unknowns. And by that, we will see that we have 12 by 16 matrix because there are some products of, of, more, of unknowns, like for instance, in this case, V and W, which will appear somewhere in this list. So we will have more monomials than, uh, than only unknowns. So despite we are looking for, for W, V, C, and T, which is 12 unknowns, in this case, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3 times 4 is 12, we have, will see four additional monomials in this list and therefore we will matrix which is 12 by 16. Now we can somehow notice that in this form, some part of that is linear and this linear part can be eliminated in the next step. This can be done by bringing this matrix into, into standard forms, reduced form with Gaussian elimination and this allows us to eliminate or express these six, uh, six unknowns in terms of this part, in terms of others, and then substitute elsewhere. And therefore we get, we get, uh, we get now only six equations in six unknowns, which is V and W. We still have 16 monomials. Once we have recover V and W, we can use this, uh, these equations to back substitute and obtain C and T. So the remaining 16 monomials look like this. So there are some degree one monomials, some degree two monomials. And we can write these guys in terms of, a, of in the following way, in the following way. Um, we kind of, kind of want to arrive at a situation when we will again eliminate some of these unknowns obtain equations in fewer unknowns, which will, which will allow us to get those fewer unknowns. So the next step will be to eliminate actually everything else except of Ws. So we would like now to eliminate Vs and be left with Ws. So in order, uh, or vice versa, Ws and leave with and it can be done both ways. Uh, so in this case, we will write these equations, which are not, which we don't write here in, on, on the slides because they are too complicated. Nevertheless, we can write them in the following way. We can put vector of Ws here and also the, the absolute term, that is the absolute term, uh, into a vector. And everything else, uh, all guys with Vs, we can put inside of a matrix to multiply this, this uh, vector of Ws. So this M of V, is will be now six times four matrix after doing that. So we six times four matrix and this matrix will contain only Vs. Now, the fact is 
that this matrix multiplies a vector. The vector is a non-zero vector because it has only it has an absolute term here, so it's never zero. So for this to have a solution, this matrix must be rank deficient, right? It's a six by four matrix. So for this uh, matrix to be rank deficient, we have to have all its four times four subdeterminants, all these um, all these uh, minors must go to zero, must be zero. Actually, if we do this, we will, if we do all four by four subdeterminants of M and we get 15 equations, there are equations in V, so in three variables, and we will see that there'll be 75 monomials. And now we are in the position when we can uh, apply the te solving technology, which I described at the beginning, and that solving technology will produce a template that means some formulas which which take which take image measurements which are coordinates in 3D and image coordinates in 2D and will construct a polynomial functions which will make us the elements of a matrix from which we will calculate eigenvectors and we will recover these uh, Vs from those eigenvectors. Uh, if done like this by the process which we implemented, which is available, we arrive at something which will run like 0.3 millisecond in C++ eigen eigenlibrary for, for uh, eigen uh, solving, which is, which is time, uh, I would say practical, of course, it's not super fast. If you do thousand times of these computations, then you will, you will get to, to to second uh, range, but it is it is uh, it is already practical. Um, now, of course, uh, the, this was done under assumptions that we have linearized the the rotation at the beginning, like the, the origin rotation. But that's of course something which means that we need to know roughly what is the original orientation, right? So we roughly need to know it. So we need some initialization of the initial position of rotation of the camera. Uh, the linearization during the motion capture, this is usually reasonably reasonable because the because the, when speeds are very high, rotation is very big, then usually images are very blurry and you can't do anything anyway. But the initial pose is a, is a little bit tricky because of course, usually we, this may be very large rotation because this just depends on the choice of the coordinate systems. So basically, we, there are like several ways how to get these initial things, like using kind of IMU things, or another possibility which we which we consider and which seems to be practical is to use uh, just to neglect rolling shutter effect in the first step, compute the pose with P3P absolute pose problem for perspective camera that will not be exact, they'll not be very accurate, but it may give you a reasonable estimate, and then correct in the next step with the with the rolling shutter computed with the full rolling shutter model. And that, that can be done. Uh, now I will show a few experiments. So uh, here we will see some real data. These, these real data are like kind of standard, standard uh, data which are, can be used to benchmark the systems. And the top image shows what happens if we compute the pose of the camera with neglecting the rolling shutter, just this, this P3P, uh, P3P uh, solver. And we, these images show points in two colors. So these are 3D correspondent, 3D points, which are matched to image points. And we see them colored. So the blue uh, points, uh, are like the points which are enter the process and in red we mark those which support the model which is computed by P3P. And the bottom one we mark with green color those which, which are fitting and supporting the model of this rolling shutter. That means computed with R6P solver. And now we see that the rolling shutter model better models, of course, the, the reality, which is actually a rolling shutter camera. We, this is a rolling shutter camera moving in the, in the world, and which gives us an indication that the rolling shutter model, our rolling shutter model, is a good, is a better model, is a better model of the reality than, than perspective model. So this was static thing, now we can see a, a dynamic piece. So if you, if you are, okay, sorry. 
the dynamic, the video shows a trunk where we move a camera from top up down and we see the same thing. So on the left hand side, we see points which, which fit the perspective model. On the right hand side, we see points which fit the, the model based on the rolling shutter. Now, we may see that there are some, I'm sorry, I want to stop this. Okay, so here is a point where we move fast. And in that case, we see that the, the, the rolling shutter model is, is a much better explanation of the situation because there is a rolling shutter, shutter effect in this case, right? There's a rolling shutter effect. So in here, the, the perspective model can explain a small number of points, but the rolling shutter model can explain many more points. Of course, when we move to the, when we are at the beginning, where the speed is very low, we basically are not moving. So then, of course, the geometry of the projection coming from the rolling shutter is the same like the geometry coming from the global shutter. So in that case, both models retain a reasonable result. And of course, the result is not always the same. Sometimes some model produces more, others produce less. Depends on how, how many random samples were drawn, how long the optimization went, and so this is a standard, standard thing to observe. There is some fluctuation of the quality as we go from image to image. Okay, so now here we some, some experiments, some, some quantitative evaluation, which was done again on Transac and uh, recovering basically the number of matches in the matching, matching phase, how many matches we recover using different models. So there is, this is a, I would say semi, kind of a controlled uh, controlled situation so we know we know sort of the matches which there are this is like the black black thing which is like the total number of matches we can get and then we look at how many such matches we were getting with the model so we see that in almost all situations the rolling shutter gave us the largest and larger number of matches of course the larger number of points is natural for for a model with more parameters but the number of parameters is much smaller than the, the increase in the number of in the number of uh, verified matches, right? So the number of parameters of a, of a perspective model is a pose of one camera, so like six parameters. The number of parameters in the rolling one is like twice as many, it's 12 parameters. So uh, we see what, what we are getting. So we have increase in the number of parameters in the complexity model, but in, in many situations, we have a considerable increase, like several times in this case, of the number of recovered data. Of course, in some cases, like here, for instance, the difference is small. And this is caused, again, mainly by the fact that at that point, the rolling shutter effect was negligible. Now, the next thing uh, is to say, well, why not, why to do, how to get rid of this, uh, this initialization, right? The initialization is a somewhat, somewhat unpleasant thing. As I said before, the problem why we did not do it from the beginning is that it's much more complicated process. So it took set certain time and certain effort in order to pick up the right model of rotation and do the right formulation, which leads to a solvable problem. And the particle formulation which we used was the pa to parameterize the rotation of the original point using the so-called Cayley parameterization. In fact, it's all like a quaternion parameterization. It's a non-unit quaternion parameterization where the first element of the quaternion is fixed to one. So this model is uh, actually, uh, this model has only three parameters for rotation. Right? So it's a kind of it's a minimal model of rotation. There's only three parameters, but we have to pay for this three, par for reducing the number of parameters. And we pay by the fact that we cannot model all the rotations. We are just losing rotations which are by 180 degrees around whatever any axis. So there will be no 180 degrees rotation possible. Of course, this may be problematic in some applications when you just kind of turn camera in the opposite directions, but still it is a zero dimensional, it's a kind of a, um, you know, zero volume set in the parameter set of, of rotations. So that's something which is, which is uh, relatively small. If we need rotation by 180 degrees, we can, of course, develop another solver, which will, which will just check 180 degrees rotations, and then we can try both, which it was not shown in this work, but it 
can be done. And when going only for 180 degrees rotations, the parameterization is of course much, uh, is still simple. Now, of course, now there is a similar process like before, which basically goes through eliminating things and, and formulating similar, similar steps and performing similar steps. At the end, uh, we obtain uh, 15 e certain equations, which we can, again, in terms of, of Vs, and we obtain certain template, which gives us, in this particular case, a higher number of solutions. So for every data, we get 64 candidates. Some of these candidates will not be real numbers, they'll be complex numbers, so we can discard them straight away. There, of course, may be still multiple real candidates, which we then verify, and for everyone, we evaluate the support and choose the one which is the best. So this is a harder problem. So this problem, to solve this problem is much harder because it, it uses full model for the initial rotation, so it doesn't assume any initialization, and therefore a harder problem will take, of course, more effort to, to, uh, to solve. And, uh, I'm sorry. So in this particular case, we will, we will achieve, we can achieve this additional tricks uh, in solving uh, only real routes or something like that. Uh, we, can, we can achieve time, time around 1.4 milliseconds. So we now jumped up from 0.3 milliseconds to 1.4 milliseconds, uh, but and pay, which is the price to pay for, for uh, having a more complex model. Um, of course, I could ask various questions. So, uh, how does this perform, for instance, compared to a very classical approach? We already initialized with P3P. So, why just not start with this and run bundle adjustment straight away? Why to still add another, another R6P inside of Ransack? So, which is the bundle adjustment, of course, is usually called local optimization. It may not be full bundle adjustment, it may be just some kind of a uh, optimization procedure, local in terms that's usually based on gradient descent, or maybe maybe it's uh, not gradient descent, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a global in sense that you solve an over constraint system of linear equations. Simply, it's some update step which allows to, to, to model more uh, complex models from more data. So, the question is, is it enough to do P3P plus local optimization or is not enough? And the answer is, of course, it depends on the situation. A situation when this is okay, there are situations that this is not okay. So for instance, this example shows a uh, picture from, from um, camera flying on a drone, uh, photographing a house and doing localization of the drone camera from points from a constructed model of that house. And we see colors of the points. So points which are green, uh, of course, they, these colors are overlaid. So actually all points which, here, which we see here have green color on the lowest, lowest, not all actually, sorry, not all, most of them, but not all. So this, is, this guy doesn't have it. So it's, these points are points which are recovered by R6P model. The red points are recovered by initializing PCP and adding local optimization. So we see that, um, that this, this, is, this is a considerable part of that, but considerably smaller part of that. And then blue guys, which are still on top of green and red, are those which were recovered just by PCP. So actually the red, red competitor here actually started with blue one and added something on top of blue one to get the red, right? So the first thing, uh, the red one started with this blue piece, recovered the model from the blue ones, and there are some blue ones over here, and then recovered, uh, then added more complex model, a rolling shutter model, used all the recovered points, blue points, estimated parameters of the model, and that brought him to, to get points which are red. The green guy in this particular case started right from the beginning with the rolling shutter model. It was the global, it was the, it was the one which was optimized by, uh, by R6P. So, um, the more complex, uh, more, I would say, uh, mm, numerical uh, comparison, 
which shows a fraction of inliers recovered. So the higher number, the better. Uh, so the green, green numbers are high numbers, red numbers are low or lower numbers. And yeah, so it shows, it compares different variations of optimization, linearizations, optimizations, and so on. Uh, and also different solvers that way. So we, if we have R6P, which has two linearizations, this is the one which is which linearizes the original thing and also the the, the rotation during the motion during the, the image capture. And this one uh, uh, does not uh, initialize the the rotation at the beginning. The result, the message here is that basically these two are almost identical in the result. So if I if I in it, if I linearize and, and initialize, then I get results which are correctly initialized and I these results. And if I don't initialize and run full guy, I get very similar results. Basically in basically undist almost undistinguishable, but but that's it. Yeah. Now when this is green, it's when this is better than just P3P this local optimization. And it is sort of always better than PCP itself. So this shows that uh, like rolling shutter modeling is for these sequences. Uh, it is appropriate, it's necessary, it gives better results. And it also shows that we can get better results this. Uh, we can get good results even when we can't initialize the, or the first pose of the camera or kind of reference pose of the camera. Okay, so an interesting thing was that we saw that there is a kind of structure in the in the equations which we which turns out to be useful and allows to do even more efficient solving. So let us look at, at this structure of the equations, these different simplifications, different linearizations, and to try to find a compromise between a full formulation, which is which models everything, which is like R and C depend uh, on the position of a camera for every row, so there is infinitely many poses, or maybe as many as there is a number of different rows, and which is in fact currently intractable with current techniques. And on the on the other side of the spectrum is some very simplified method. So now let's try to do the simplification. So the first simplification, which we did was exactly like a rotation during capture and initial rotations are linearized. So we can really linearize this P3P. It works, it must run P3P and, uh, and P6P kind of thing. So it's uh, not super, it's not, it's, it's, I would say useful, but it's not, it's not super fast vehicle. Uh, we can go for less uh, initialization, which brings us to um, basically the, the model, which is only single in a single initialization during the during the uh, image capture, and has non and doesn't need to have initialization for the original for the first pose. That one is good, but as we saw, it was slower. So this one was like 0.3 milliseconds. This one like 1.4 milliseconds. 1.4 milliseconds is for real-time system, uh, not very practical. It can be, of course, useful for a 3D reconstruction system, which, which run or offline on many computers, but for real times, it's not really practical. So the quest was what to do in order to get something which would be uh, still faster and would work reasonably well. So the, so the problem basically is let's try to, to make faster method, which would start from P3P initialization and then do something which is faster than, than the, the solver, R6P solver with single initialization. And this was the, this, this can be done in the following way. We, we can notice certain structure in the equations, which we will be able to use in order to to alternate between two linear problems. So basically we can do something which we could understood as a coordinate wise descent with a local optimization, but it will use a special structure of the system. And the special structure of the system is that if we multiply through this model, then we will see that these V's and W's will appear at certain point together. 
and together they will appear uh, in one term. Everywhere else, they will be kind of a linear. So we kind of con C's and, and, and T's separated, and there will be X's, which are known, of course, and then V, v and W in the product, which is, which is bilinear, unknown, and there will be linear terms. So we see that there is this, this structure. So once we have this structure, that means we take these equations, we expand it, we get it like that, we see the structure. This is, this is basically the only term where we have, we have this product, these nonlinear non -linear forms inside of our equations. We can, we can alternate computation in such a way that we always fix one of them and compute the other. But what is important is that we don't do this for, that we don't really fix W in this equation. We just fix W in this term of this equation, and then we fix V in this term of the equation. So at every step, we actually compute all the unknowns, Vs and Ws and Cs and Ts, but we, we modify the equations from step to step, right? And we alternate. So we fix V, compute, w, we fix V to something V hat, let's say, and compute again V, C, W, and T, because we see that we fix that V only in this term. And the same is here. It's we, we fix W and compute that V. So this is fixed the, the other part of the thing. Now, experiments show that this, is, uh, this works. Uh, various variations have been tried with different, different schemes of what could be fixed and what could be left uh, as unknown. And basically, the final thing came out that uh, was what I described. Now, the question is how many iterations to do, because this method is, a, is basically a, in, is a local optimization method, so it should iterate until convergence. But it seems to be converging reasonably fast. So here is an, some example with five iterations, which was already very perfect. Three iterations actually do also most of the work. So three iterations might be actually enough for, the, for many practical situations. And again, we see this evaluated uh, on the previous result. So this is just illustrative figure, which again shows the green, in this case, are alternating solvers. Uh, red are just R6Ps and, uh, and blues are another, uh, blues, 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 blues are perhaps also R6P of diff with different model. I was, ah, so red will be P3P and this will be R6P. Yeah, and now, so this is illustrating the different results and should show that alternating models work as, uh, as good as full R6P model. Here in this part of the figure, we have a numerical comparison. So we show the number of inliers they covered in different, for different images, for different images with different methods. Actually, there's another method which is called R9P. That method uses nine image correspondences to, to, compute, to compute everything. And this method, of course, in case we, we really sample a correct sample is a, is a better method. So of course, it's a very good method, but we pay the price and the price is for sampling, for, for looking for a non-contaminated sample from nine in nine points, which is, which is of course, uh, high, which needs a high, higher number of samples than six points or three points, of course, much, sample, much bigger than three points. So that's it. So we see that the green guy, which is, uh, which is uh, the, the linearized guy with, with five iterations, is achieving basically the same performance like the R6P, full R6P, is overcoming in all cases and sometimes by, by large margins, overcoming just using P3P. So, and of course, this difference between P3P and it depends on the, on the, uh, on the size or on the magnitude of rolling shutter effect. And, and also we see that <coughs> It's kind of compares with the nine nine point nine point method, which is which uses more data, and if the data is clean, has better better of course chance to get good result. So finally, what is like important is and why we did this this kind of an alternation method is to get speed, and the speed is much much higher than previously, 
So we are going down from, let's say, 1.7 in this particular experiment uh, millisecond, uh, 1,700 uh, microseconds down to 10 microseconds. So now this, this solver uh, runs 10 microseconds uh, on top of PCP initialization, which runs, which is a single, you know, one to three microsecond issue, depending how implemented. And that together basically brings us to times which are, which are useful for runtime. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say. This concludes my talk. Again, this was uh, work which was uh, which is most of co technical contributions from Chenya Kalbel, Zuzana Kukalva, Viktor Larsen, and Akio Sugmoto. Thank you for attention.